What can you tell us about the U.S. and British airstrikes and, and what this could mean uh, moving forward as far as potential ramifications? Well, you got to understand that, that the, while this was very showy and there's lots of good video and there was up to 100 missiles that were fired in, in 16 different locations. I mean, it sounds pretty impressive on the surface of it, but you got to look at the at the bottom line is what's this supposed to accomplish? Is this going to make shipping in the Red Sea safer? Is this going to deter uh, the Houthis? And the answer is almost certainly no. As a matter of fact, I think the most likely outcome is this is going to uh, accelerate the activities of, of Yemen. Well, see, what we don't seem to understand is, is internally, this is something I think that Yemen was baiting us to do because this actually raises their, their uh, credibility within their country, within their countrymen, and it also solidifies support, by, support behind them. So I think that they're going to increase their attacks, and I think they're probably going to make good on their threats to uh, expand their target list to American assets in the region. So I think that in the end of the day, this is not going to work well for us. Mm. But that that's precisely the problem. It was a classic damned if you, da damned right. if you do, damned if you don't scenario. If you do nothing after two dozen attacks, you look weak and your words look empty. Then when you do attack, they're obviously not going to go, oh, sorry, America, we'll stop now. They're going to escalate. So in that scenario, you, you lose in a way, no matter what you do. So between doing nothing and doing something, at least in that sense, do you believe we made the right call, the U.S. and U.K., by doing this? No, I don't, because I, I think if you have a choice between doing nothing and things smoldering or, or even doing some other non-kinetic things like, you know, trying some diplomatic thing, there are some levers that we have. There are some things that we could do in the region. Look, the, their stated purpose was that they want to bring more food aid into the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip, and they're behind them because they're co-religionists. And so, I mean, we could have done something like that. If, people say, no, you can't negotiate with them. Well, here's the, con the converse. If you don't negotiate with them, then you now you go to the other side and you use more kinetic. And if that increases their threat and increases the threat to, to, uh, to the shipping, then obviously that's counterproductive to what we want to accomplish. So I think that if you between the choices that you had, damned if you do, damned if you don't, if you damned this way, you're damned worse, so to speak. So I think that, that we're going down a path here which could escalate, and eventually it could even include Iran because people are already saying Iran's the one behind them, so you need to expand the target list up there. And I'm telling you, that's a slippery slope we don't want to go down. Yeah. We have talked several times throughout the course of this conflict, um, and this I think is probably, and Rob, maybe you can agree, the most urgent I've heard your tone being as mm. far as concern level. Um, where does that stand right now? And you just mentioned Iran getting involved here. I mean, are we looking at us having to now be fully involved, and that's what everyone has tried to prevent from the very beginning? They have, but now that this, you know, everything takes on a life of its own. So we have now had up to 137, I believe was the last count I had, attacks on American troops in Iraq and Syria. We talked about that on your show yeah. several times when it was like 118 or something, and now it's continued to expand. Still no Americans have been killed. We've been lucky so far. Don't know how long that luck's going to hold. The the issue on the northern border of Israel with Hezbollah has been increasing, getting more tense in the last recent days. With all of these assassinations that have been going on in Baghdad, in Beirut, uh, and in Syria, all of the the, sub, the people who have been hit have been vowing revenge. So everywhere you look, the ramping up of people saying that they're going to do more and more, which puts us in a position, like you said, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, but you keep responding and the attacks keep coming. So you see, that's why I'm so alarmed because we keep seeming to get deeper and deeper with fewer and fewer good options. That region is a is a tinderbox, right. and in some ways it was predictable that we were going to get dragged deeper and deeper into this, as you just kind of very eloquently and realistically laid out, which we, which we appreciate. But the worst case scenario is U.S. and Iran in a direct conflict. If you had on a scale of 1 to 10 to rate that likelihood this morning, what would your number be? Well, the, 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 the odds are going up. I mean, you've got to be 6, 7 right now. But look, this is a choice that we can make. This is not anything that we're going to be forced into. And it's time for the U.S. government to make some hard choices and decisions that says we're going to take Americans' interest in it to, to the best uh, of our actions. And that means that we may have to eat a little crow here and do everything we can to get the war in Gaza tamped down, do everything we can diplomatically to de-escalate things, not to continually go to the military force, because that's just not going to, it's not going to work out for us. We've got to do something different.
And that's a matter of also Israel agreeing to right. do that, not just saying what we want. They have to well, carry out that. Thing, what they do, we have some leverage because of all the support. So right. we're not an I mean, we are a player, but we do have some leverage there.